everybody and thanks for having me here. Um, I'm delighted to introduce um, Mike Kelly to you. Mike was going to be here in person, but unfortunately because of the train strikes, he is going to be with us virtually, but we are confident that we can manage hybridity these days. We've been getting better and better at it during the pandemic. So Mike will appear in a few moments. As Carol said, I personally have a long history of working on social science aspects of public health and policy, global health, etc. So it's really interesting to me that Mike is someone who actually began life um, with a degree in sociology and also um, working on uh, economics at the University of York. But he's had a very mixed, I mean, a little bit like we were talking about with the technology, a bit of a hybrid kind of career, if you like. So he began by undertaking that, those degrees in sociology and economics at the University of York. But then he went on to do a PhD in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Dundee and then after that held various academic appointments at universities of Leicester, Dundee, Abertay, Greenwich, Glasgow, Manchester, Oxford, etc. He's been in academia now for 27 years, but what he's probably most well known for, I would say, is that whilst he's currently a senior visiting uh, fellow in the Department of Public Health and Primary Care here at Cambridge, he also, and a member of John's, of course, he, he has most recently, between 2005 and 2014, been the director of the Centre for Public Health at the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, which we know as NICE. And there he led various teams to develop policy on public health guidelines, etc. He was a regular visitor when at NICE on all of those shows that we know and watch and so well, the Today Program, BBC, ITV, Sky, etc. He's advised the House of, House of Commons um, Health Select Committee and been a witness before parliamentary um, committees on a variety of different occasions. And he's also chaired other related committees that are allied to um, public health, for example, things like the Food Standards Agency and so forth. He has also a long history of working for the World Health Organization and their commission on the social determinants of health. And that there, I think he's most well known for his work on really using evidence-led methodologies to create public health policies and guidelines. So without further ado, if Mike is with us, I'm going to hand over to him for his presentation and then we'll have a question and answer session following that. So Mike, if you can hear me, over to you. He's in a tiny little box, which I hope is gonna get bigger. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Mike, but you're not on full screen. So could you put yourself... Oh, is he? Okay, that's great. There you are. Okay. Yep, we can we see you now. Roll? Yep. <laughs> okay, um, thanks for that introduction, Bronwyn. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. And I'm really, really disappointed I'm not there. We've been planning today's event for about two and a half years. And um, it never got off the starting blocks a couple of times because of COVID. And then we finally got it off the starting blocks and ready to roll. And I'm abandoned here in Edinburgh and unable. Well, I was able to get there. I couldn't have got back. That was the problem. Anyway, I, it forced me to bring the day to a conclusion and to try and draw together some of the strands that we've been talking about and to reflect on the implications of all of this. Um, for the future in terms of both policy and research. But I want to begin by thinking about some of the evidence gaps which were revealed uh, by COVID and by our response in the United Kingdom. And I think it's the same in Scotland and in England and Northern Ireland. It wasn't simply uh, the UK government's problem. But there were a number of very clear gaps. Um, that is to say evidence which simply wasn't used. Um, of course, at the beginning, we heard and we heard it repeated throughout that they were going to follow the science. And in important respects, that's what happened. But it was only part of the science. And a lot of the science and other things that we know were simply not drawn into the equation. We heard from Simon first thing about not having a historical perspective, but it wasn't just history. 
as I'll say. Now, the first thing I want to focus on, and it's been a theme running through uh, today's discussion, was the missing communities. Communities, communities, communities. That is to say, um, in spite of um, a rhetoric um, about which we've heard a lot today, the knowledge residing in local communities about their everyday lives, which should and could have informed the response to the pandemic, simply was never utilised. It was a clear missing link in the evidence. Now, it's not that we know nothing about what goes on in communities. Um, there is, after all, um, a fairly important scientific literature on that. But probably much more important than that is the knowledge that communities themselves have, the, have of the way they live, their everyday life, their life worlds. And the sorts of things which make foreign rules about social isolation, going to work, trying to run homeschooling, I mean, the whole gamut of stuff about which we heard so much during the pandemic was never really used in terms of the information that lies there as it were hidden in plain sight. The second really, really important thing about communities is that, as we know now, we saw from Kevin's data this morning, there were clearly different rates of infection, different rates of severe infection and hospitalization, and different rates of mortality from COVID in different communities. Now, I don't think I was the only person who couldn't have missed during the first few weeks of, the, of lockdown, that every evening we'd have that solemn moment during the BBC News um, when they would talk about NHS workers who had died of COVID. And perhaps the most striking thing about the photographs that they showed was almost, well, many, many evenings, the people whose photographs were shown were members of ethnic minority communities. Now, I suppose one might have thought, well, okay, is this a chance observation? Is this the BBC running a particular, particular angle? But it certainly looked like something that was worth following up. And of course, we now know it wasn't a chance observation. It wasn't the BBC. That was the reality of the data relating to mortality. What did we do about it? Well, it took six months, as Kevin reminded us, before anyone started collecting data about mortality and ethnicity in a way that was usable anyway. What did we then do? We collected more data. What about acting on the fact that there's certain communities were at much greater risk than others? There was a huge opportunity missed, but also an opportunity to find out what was going on in those communities. There were a few local directors of public health, notably I'd think of um, Blackburn and Darwin's a case in point, Warrington's another one, where the local directors were vociferous in arguing the case, but its implication for the use of evidence policy-wise and nationally was nil. There was also this extraordinarily obvious, again, fairly early on, association between ethnic group membership, socioeconomic stations, socioeconomic circumstances and age and mortality. And the, the interesting relationship that that seemed to suggest, admittedly in the early data, only associational, never seems to have been followed up. We collected more data about it, but followed up in terms of action, no. Even though, as I said a moment ago, it was there in plain sight. Who had the knowledge and evidence about the communities? Well, obviously the communities themselves is a very important resource that was simply bypassed as far as I can tell. The communities themselves, in other words, were the major missing link in the evidence. And this is all the more surprising because back in the days when I first started working in public health, um, not long afterwards anyway, the Ottawa Charter on Health Promotion was produced. Seems like ancient history perhaps. But the Ottawa Charter laid out a set of principles at the core of which were many of the things that have been discussed here today in terms of working from the grassroots upwards, working together with communities, not in some notional partnership, but actually working in, in the jargon we talk about today, co-production. I don't think we used those words back in the 19, uh, late 1980s. 
But it's not as if we know nothing about this. And it's not as if there isn't a long decades old tradition of working with communities in order to understand what the world looks like from inside those communities and learning from it. Not the public health specialist or policymaker deciding what's good for those communities, but what those communities themselves, how they see the world and the sorts of things will help and understand them. Now, this isn't just a wish list because we've got decades of both academic and practical um, knowledge on how this is done and how it works. It was called bottom up. I think sometimes you still use that phrase, but working from, as someone called it earlier on in the discussion, working from the grassroots. In those days, the Ottawa Charter talked about community empowerment. Well, we've just lived through a pandemic where community disempowerment seemed to be the order of the day throughout. We know now we saw a more fashionable word perhaps for um, uh, this approach, sometimes called the asset based approach, the, the recognition that within communities there is a wealth of not just knowledge, but those communities are themselves not devoid of any kind of skills, capabilities or understanding. It's just that we never or we very seldom make room to, to use those assets and capabilities and to, re to release them in such a way um, that they can be powerful drivers, both for the health of those communities collectively and individually. It seemed for a long period, well, perhaps throughout the pandemic, that when I listened to ministers um, beginning to struggle to understand the problems of multi-generational occupational houses, of the fact that many people couldn't work for home for all the reasons that Simon outlined in his talk first thing this morning. But the patterns of work, rest and leisure of ordinary people are not mysterious, unknowable things. They're there for us to gather and understand by simply working and talking to those communities. Robin mentioned I began my career in sociology and the way a sociologist would talk about this, that everyday life has recursive repeating patterns for good and ill. And they're not mysterious, they're not unknowable, but we can understand that recursivity, the things that keep on causing the knocks and blows and travails to people's lives, which are the source of um, the basic inequalities that we see um, in everyday lives of um, in the data and so on that we're looking at, we've looked at today. Another very, very important source of this information is of course local primary health care team, uh, local public health teams and primary care teams. I'm involved in a research project at the moment where we've been talking to local directors of public health um, about their experience of the pandemic and about their what they tried to do um, when the vaccines began to be rolled out and they this problem that seemed to take central government completely by surprise, uh, vaccine hesitancy. Now, the view from the directors of public health that we've been talking to is that central government clawed in power to itself through the pandemic, both in London and in Edinburgh. They both did it. Um, and in so doing, they disempowered perhaps the most valuable resource that they had to hand, those local public health teams, along with the knowledge they had and along with the skill base that they possessed. Why? Well, why did they do that? Well, that's an answer for the political scientists to give us. But the familiarity with local population groups that local primary care teams and public health teams have, because that's what they do every day of their working lives, um, was, was discounted. Now, I don't know where it was discounted, whether it was discounted in the um, deliberations of SAGE or whether it was never ever, or when it went up the, the, the line to the senior um, decision makers, that's where it got lost. But in any event, whatever, wherever it got lost, it was lost. Second thing, of course, and it was touched upon several times today, is that the experience in local public health teams of infection control and managing um, infectious disease outbreaks, that's what they do. That's what you train to do when you're going through the public health training program. But instead, as Simon reminded us, um, we brought in private contractors um, to engage 
in um, not, perhaps not infection control so much, but the track and trace activities, which will be part and parcel of managing any disease outbreak. Well, I, I don't know, it, but it beggars belief um, that that was the line that central government took. Um, and, and you know, one of these days we might get an answer to the reason that decision was made, but I, on the face of it, I can't see a good reason why it was made. And of course, many of the speakers and questioners and discussants today have mentioned that from a period from 2010 onwards, resource had been stripped away from those public health teams um, during the years of austerity. And I think that's certainly a matter of fact. The consequences were severe, but there were still teams there. It wasn't as if they'd gone completely, but even what was left um, was ignored. So along with it, the local expertise, experience and knowledge. And it never seems to have filtered up in terms of the understanding of the way, um, well, the way the vaccine would be um, responded to, but everything else that, that, that preceded it. Now I want to change tack um, to another, what I see as a major a gap in the evidence, even though it was there, as it were, in plain sight from early on. Um, Simon mentioned uh, Richard Horton's comment about the syndemic um, in a piece that appeared in the Lancet, I think in about June um, or July in 2020. So the pandemic is uh, a, a two or three months into, um, or we're two or three months into lockdown, first lockdown. Now, what Horton says in very plain terms is it's not a pandemic, it's a syndemic, by which he meant this coming together, um, this mixing together of several things. And I'll, I'll break it down into the component parts. First, the link between this particular virus and pre-existing medical conditions. Now I'll take you back again to the early days of the pandemic when, the newsreader each night would intone this mysterious thing called pre-existing medical conditions, which seemed to be uh, the trigger for um, excess mortality. Although you might remember, I can't recall a single edition of the news bulletin where it was explained what these pre-existing medical conditions actually were. Well, this is what they were. Diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, COPD, chronic kidney disease, obesity, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease in particular. Now, that's an interesting list because of course it's precisely the list that drives the R, the non-communicable diseases and their sequelae, which drive the pattern of health inequalities in the UK and in most of the Western world. Hmm. Now there's an interesting connection. It is astonishing to me that that interesting connection seems to have been, well, I don't know where it went, um, but it didn't seem to, you know, why were we talking about these mysterious pre-existing medical conditions when we should have been absolutely upfront? And what were we doing to protect people who had these pre-existing medical conditions? What was being done in terms of GP lists about patients with these conditions and their increased level of risk? So we begin to build the picture that Horton was talking about. That is to say the links between these diseases and health inequalities and the virus. The syndemic he was talking about was a perfectly predictable storm. In other words, it wasn't, and it shouldn't have been a surprise. There was enough pre-existing knowledge, and I'll come on to the pre-existing knowledge in a moment or two, that would have allowed us to say, well, hang on, once we got that, you know, the basic idea about what was going on with respect to the virus and its interaction with populations, clearly um, there were other actions that could have been taken, uh, which weren't. It was syndemic. And the syndemic refers to this three-way interaction between the virus, pre-existing conditions and social deprivation and disadvantage. And as I said on other occasions, anyone with a passing familiarity with multimorbidity, non-communicable diseases, health inequalities, could have made a fairly shrewd guess that we we're in for a really bad time um, with this virus once it began to be clear that that's the way it was panning out. Our knowledge and understanding, our pre-existing knowledge and understanding of health inequalities could, in other words, should, in other words, have been enormously helpful in planning the response, even within months of the response to the pandemic. 
but I can see almost no evidence of that other than perhaps we began to collect more data about these differences, not to do much about it. Oh, there was an occasion, of course, when Simon Stevens sent round um, a missive July 2020, I think, to all NHS organisations, instructing them to do something about health inequalities because of its importance in the pandemic. But you can look through that missive from Sir Simon to see what they were supposed to do, what a typical GP practice was supposed to do, what an ambulance service was supposed to do, what a hospital was supposed to do with that instruction. And there's no how to at all. It was an instruction devoid of any kind of, um, any kind of possible traction as to how you might do it. And the pre-existing knowledge I mentioned a moment ago comes from the Far East and the experience of SARS. Now, there are a series of papers published early in the century um, from researchers in Hong Kong um, and in Singapore, which point out that the coronavirus, which SARS was, had an acute interaction with certain pre-existing medical conditions, the ones that were just on my list on the previous slide. It's there in the literature, and these are not obscure um, journals that no one has ever heard of. This is mainstream medical science. And yet that learning from SARS, and people often say, well, what we didn't learn from SARS is to lock down quickly. That's true enough. But what we also didn't do was note this interaction between the pre-existing medical conditions and that particular coronavirus. Now, medical colleagues have said to me, but hang on, you're making a leap too far there, Mike, because um, it could, the, that was one coronavirus, this was a different one. Well, of course, one has to acknowledge that. But again, looking at the way the data was panning out very early on, surely it was worth a look. And this isn't a mystery. It's there recorded in the textbooks. Um, following off on the publication of those papers, um, an American anth medical anthropologist called Singer uh, published a tech book, textbook called Syndemics, in which he outlines all of this. Um, so it's, <laughs> yeah, it's not very obscure stuff, um, but it appears, I, I don't know where it was, but it certainly doesn't seem to have driven policy in the United K Kingdom. And instead, we were told we were all in it together. That's why I proposed that question to the panel um, earlier on. Um, well, to some extent, yes, we were, but we were all in it together differently. Um, and actually the members of the general public worked that out pretty quickly, I think. Um, so where does this leave us then in thinking about future, future research and questions uh, and future policy? Well, I think there are a number of, um, for me at least, really, really, really important research questions, which our scientific community need to be thinking about moving toward. And they're as follows. First, the relationship between bio, the bio, biological and the social. Now, those of us who've worked in inequalities in health all our careers, know about the association between biology and society. But um, the pandemic has revealed and thrown it, crystallized it into absolute stark relief. And I think there is, there is the need for much, much more effort in trying to bridge the disciplines where these things happen. Unfortunately, I have to say, uh, my own original discipline, sociology, shows relatively little interest um, in biology. In fact, many sociologists, their idea of biology ends just about with Charles Darwin. Um, but of course, modern microbiology takes us many, many steps further um, it, with things like epigenetics and metabolomics and that kind of thing. I also think one of the things that the, the pandemic has thrown in stark relief is that drawing hard and fast boundaries between disciplines, between the sociological, anthropo anthropological, psychological, and the biological, and the medical, um, is never gonna get us very far. We have to be much, much more open to genuine interdisciplinary work. I think going with that, it's important to begin to unravel the pathways in these syndemic relationships. How do they actually work? 
that relationship between social structures, and we've heard a lot about social structures today, and it's easy to talk about social structures or to talk about institutionalized racism, but how does that actually work in terms of biological changes in the human body? Because it does, it has an effect, and what is it? Not the same kind of medicine or same kind of science as the way T cells work, but it's no less an important question for that. And I'd really like to drive forward a research agenda where those mechanistic um, relationships, those causal pathways are studied um, across the boundaries. The work Alistair reported is one small example of we trying to delve into where those mechanisms might be. And we've begun that project by thinking about, well, what's there in the data sets already? What can we learn from things like the ELSA data set about these mechanisms? And as you heard from uh, Alistair's presentation before lunch, it turns out it's quite difficult to do that because of the way the data are collected and so on and so forth. But that doesn't make it an unimportant question to follow. We just need to be a bit more adventurous, I think, in taking it forward. I think the other, another important area is where the sociology in particular can come in, the recursive nature of everyday life. People's ordinary lives have an effect on their health. And with COVID, it happened in two ways. So in one level, the pre-existing medical conditions, which are linked to the recursive patterns, the assaults and the noxious um, insults to the human body that occur across the life course because of people's lived experience of the worlds in which they live, we need to plot, we not only need to plot, but of course that set up the vulnerability. But then of course, the pathways, the vectors to infection about interaction, about work patterns, about being on the front line, about being a taxi driver are also part of the recursive patterns of human life. So it's a twofold um, approach that we need to pull apart if we're really gonna get to the bottom of how this did, how this would work. And as I said at the beginning, the importance of community-based studies. We don't do enough community-based studies. They were very popular in the 50s. And we know a lot about mining communities in South Yorkshire, circa 1956. We know much less about South Yorkshire and the community structure um, in 2022. And I think that's a big gap in our knowledge. Finally, policy implications. Well, yeah, we've got to follow the science. But, but, follow the relevant science, not just a narrowly focused part of it. I think one of my biggest criticisms of the UK's response to this is not that they didn't follow the science, but they followed a very narrow part of the science. Virology, immunology, infectious disease modelling ruled the roost. And that whole other swathe of knowledge and understanding across medical science, epidemiology, and of course, the social and behavioral sciences appears to have played almost no part at all, even though some of the best behavioral scientists in the country were on stage. But whatever the politics of it were, the effects weren't great. We need to use locally based public health teams and their knowledge and skills properly. They must never be sidelined again, never. Um, and that resource must be a central part. And indeed, we should be pushing back against the desire of central governments, whether they're in Holyrood or in Westminster, to draw power to themselves. We need to learn from communities. And as Kevin reminded us, we mustn't forget the lessons we learned with HIV and AIDS, all that community-based stuff. It's the kind of stuff I cut my public health teeth on in Glasgow in the 1980s. And yet it was as if none of that had ever happened. And that, I think, again, is, you know, where I started really in this talk, the gap in the evidence. Anyway, some of the things I've said to you this afternoon, you can find in this paper, relation between the biological and well, social and biological published in public health. I've also blogged a bit on some of the failings of the evidence, but I'll leave you with those thoughts. Um, I'm not quite as optimistic as some of our speakers have been, but neither am I as pessimistic as some of them have been. I think there are ways forward, um, but those ways forward are gonna take more than a wish. They're gonna take more than simply reorganizing the pieces and the, moving the deck chairs around as it were. Um, it, it requires a really a desire to do it differently. And when Simon draws our attention to the fact that things did happen differently, during the second half of the Victorian era. Um, 
it reminds us that change is possible. When you look at what happened in the rebuilding of the United Kingdom after the Second World War to create a consensus that lasted as well, and which incidentally brought down health inequalities to the lowest that we ever had ever seen by the time we get to the late 60s, early 70s. Um, those things are possible, they're not impossible. And neither are some of the things investigating these things scientifically. They're, they're complicated for sure, they're complex for sure. But that's what we do, we're scientists. That's what we do. We shouldn't shy away from it just because it's difficult. And at that point, Bronwyn, I shall stop. Thank you very much, Mike. <laughs> Terrific. That's fantastic. And I, I really appreciated your advocacy of interdisciplinarity there. You know, as someone who's spent the last decade creating, a, I'm sure you'll be very happy to know, a now thriving growing Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's, which focuses exclusively on the relationship between the biological and the sociological. I think we're really kitting out, we are a new generation of young researchers who will be very well equipped to deal with these matters, I hope, in a much more nuanced way going forward than perhaps we have been able to do in the past. So I'll turn to the floor. Um, does anyone, would anyone like to lead the questions? I have a question that they'd like to ask Mike. Yes. I just wanted Mike to give you... Um... Mike, I wondered if you knew of any other country that had ignored its own extant local public health capacity to anything like the extent that this happened in the UK. I mean, we know the opposite happened in Korea and, and China and so on, but it, I do think you, you're right that this was something extraordinary and um, in my view it was to do with the ideology. It's the same ideology that produced austerity that ran the whole thing down in the first place. Um, you know, it was an ideology that said there's the state and there's markets and there's consumers and this other stuff doesn't matter. We don't want to put resources into the how, how awkward that the pandemic means we've got to give resources to this stuff we don't believe in local government and public health it, it, the answer to your question is simon no i don't uh, that i think the comparative um and a comparative study across um different jurisdictions is urgently needed um i, I mean i'm obviously very familiar with what happened in in the uk um and you know watched in horror as the whole thing unfolded and, you know, despaired at the, um, you know, the inability to learn from what we already knew. We didn't have to go out and do new research. You know, this stuff wasn't, um, it, it's there. But anyway, no, I don't know of, of those jurisdictions, um, but I think the it would be an extraordinarily interesting thing to do. And I guess in preparation for the public inquiry, that's coming along. That sort of uh, comparative study um, and comparative evidence would be very, very um, helpful um, to know. I mean, I, you know, the different structures in, say, Germany, where the federal system, you know, each of the, um, the German states were doing things slightly different. Similarly, the United States, and you have this overlay of um, um, national politics in places like Brazil and the US as well. Um, so it's not an easy story to tell, but I do think the, um, you know, the, the comparative um, role of local, the municipal in all of this um, is, is, is a fascinating story to, 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 to examine. Thank you, David. Mike, smashing stuff, and thank you very much indeed. I mentioned earlier, and I'm sure to a responsive audience, that community development and social work has been the, um, the, the, the forgotten concept within these wider group of um, connections. And I just, you mentioned ABC, ABC. Can I just mention ABCD, of course, which in Manchester and elsewhere, means that groups of people get together with, with leaders, with uh, participants, with people from a range of backgrounds, and by doing so creates, for example, a huge community centre um, that um, um, 
Family group conference approaches is a way in which you work, especially with, this, with children in care and their families, to say, OK, let the professionals swap routes with you and see what places with you and see what you would do, and so on and so forth. The, th the third one is the strength approach. By admitting that the person you're working with is the central person in, in, in the field, in the problem-solving business. And if you build up their strengths and their commitment, they can easily do what social workers and other people have done too often badly in their working lives. Yeah, you. I, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's the, the techniques, the understanding, and the, the ways of working are very well established and they're not, you know, we haven't got to invent them de novo. Um, but there are a couple of, um, as it were, other institutional problems that make this difficult. Um, and the, the first is the difficulty, if you want to develop this kind of thing, of getting the imprimatur of the scientific establishment to take seriously this as um, a way of population health improvement. Now, I've been involved in community-based studies right back to the mid 1980s in the west of Scotland. And, you know, we were fighting a battle then, so we've just getting on for 40 years ago, um, to, for it to be acknowledged as a legitimate public health domain. Um, last year before last, I managed to get the first ever grant from NIHR that I managed to achieve to do a series of community-based investigations of community-led organizations in, uh, in Glasgow, Belfast, um, on the South Coast and in East London. But pushing that past the, um, the, pushing it through NIHR was extraordinarily difficult because winning the argument that this is a legitimate approach to developing not just a way of improving health, but it is scientifically um, grounded um, takes a lot of convincing. And I think in part, the reason it was all ignored in the major thrust of policy during the pandemic was it's not considered by quite a lot of very senior scientists in our country to be real science. Thank you, David. Any other questions? Yep, I've got a couple more. Thank you. Um, just following up what you said, Mike, about um, what's considered as real science and what's not, it'd be really uh, fascinating to hear what you, how you think NICE engages with that, because my experience of NICE is that their um, emphasis on RCTs, for example, and kind of misunderstanding of complex models of public health intelligence and how that works is actually exactly enacting the stuff that you've described, but you're right at the heart of NICE as well. So I'd just be fascinated to hear what you think about that. Okay, well, that's another story, but I, I ran the public health program at NICE from 2005 to 2014. And one of the first things that we did was to ensure that the evidence base that we were using to develop the new public health guidelines was as broad as possible, both in disciplinary and in terms of its reach, um, as possible. And in other words, we were not to confine ourselves in the public health domain uh, to randomised controlled trials. And we kind of won that battle. And if you look at the, the 50 or so guidelines that were produced under my, my guidance, um, there are some where we relied upon the RCTs because that was the nature of the evidence, but there were many which didn't, including the stuff on community, um, community engagement, as I think we called it, um, and many of the other things on mental well-being and, and so on. But it's no secret if I tell you that that was a battle in itself within NICE to win the argument um, and to create a, a rather different way of thinking about the nature of evidence um, that, um, that public health and then subsequently social care requires. I left in 2014 and um, I'm not sure that um, those gains that we made in those years have necessarily been sustained. Um, so, yeah, um, uh, but perhaps all I, I'm a great supporter of NICE, I should say, and it was a wonderful place to work. But winning the battle for public health and winning the battle for a broader um, 
array of evidence and met methods um, was not, not easy. Um, we sort of had to rewrite the methods textbook um, in, order, in order to do it. Thanks, Mike. That's great. Um, we're just about at time now, so we're just going to have one last question before we wrap up. At the back, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, I, I just uh, I just had one question about um, my, my own path has taken me back to primary care um, to gain a lens, really, into health behaviours and inequality and how deprivation plays out in people's lives. Because, frankly, as a public health professional, I felt that I didn't have that immediate engagement um, and and actually the research was not telling me what I what I felt the true story was in terms of the how the healthcare was uh, how the health service was performing and um, and the those those that really were not uh, being picked up in the data that, that we used to sort of inform decision making. Um, I'm also concerned by the gulf in the language used, even just with, between public health and primary care, and and um, the Alma Art Declaration, the Ottawa um, uh, Charter. All of those paint a much broader role for primary care in health promotion and um, public health more broadly. And I really want, just wondered what your take was in how we can. Uh, Build the advocacy role and build the the agenda really to to fight to fight the political fight as being outlined by Simon and others that's really needed um, and and be speaking from the same hymn sheet really rather than sort of a tribal uh, breakdown of the system uh, playing out in front of our eyes. Thank you. Hmm, it's <laughs> a difficult one, Ella, isn't it? Um, the and we could spend all the afternoon um, discussing it. It's a real problem though, you're dead right. And the, the tribalism that you mentioned there toward the end of your question, I think is a uh, you know, big part of the initial difficulty we face. There are many colleagues, however, who cross between primary care and public health and do it in ways that are you know, extraordinary. Um, when I think of, you know, some of the things that um, people like Graham Watt achieved um, in Scotland, for example, um, and, and others, um, the deep dive working in the, um, the communities in which primary care was located in particularly um, deprived communities has been both a model of how things can be done and is a beacon to, to public health itself. Um, no accident, of course, uh, Graham Watt worked in both camps, um, both as a GP and he was a colleague of mine in the Department of Public Health at the University of Glasgow. So it's, it requires a rather, um, it requires rather more mobile professionals, perhaps, but allowing colleagues on both, in both tribes, as it were, the opportunity to come out of them and spend a bit of time um, working across the piece. Because most GPs that I've ever met who are working in these you know, the most difficult um, circumstances of um, different communities with, with multiple problems and so on, are only too well aware of them. And they're only also too well aware of their own, their own limits as to what they can do. But their tie up very often with public health colleagues um, is, not, is not great. Um, so that behoves us as professionals, really, to try and you know, break those barriers down and, and do better at it. Um, in terms of the, the research, though, there is another dimension to this, which I think you know, some of us in the St. John's group on inequalities have talked about a bit, which is that there's a lot of evidence that we have that defines the problem, tells us we've got a problem. Kevin laid a lot of it out this morning. Um, and you know there are libraries and libraries full of um, learned papers telling us we got a problem with health inequalities. Um, that really is not in doubt. Um, but what we don't have, and we also have a lot on the etiology of the relevant diseases underlying the stratification of population health. But what we don't have very much about, and it's kind of this cropped up a couple of times in the discussions earlier today, is how you do something about it. How do you translate that knowledge 
into practical, useful, what to do at local level. And that, I think, is, is, is perhaps the biggest gap we have in our public health and primary care evidence base. And one of the things that you know, I've been banging on about for several years now in Cambridge is, well, can we set, set something up that will allow us to develop that part of the evidence base rather than yet more studies about you know, how bad it all is and let's wring our hands and cry global social injustice. Well, that's all very well, but it doesn't get very far. It's hands on, on the ground doing stuff. If only you knew what to do. Thank you. That's great, Mike. Thank you so much. Well, um, given that we faced all of the difficulties of an extended rail strike, I think it's a testament to our fortitude and commitment that so many people have managed to make it here today. I'd like to thank everybody who presented and everybody who made the effort to come and contribute to the discussion. It's been fantastic to have you all here. I know Carol will want to probably say a few words in closing, uh, so I'll hand over to her, but thank you very much again for this terrific session. Thanks, thanks, Bronwyn, and for making a special effort to come uh, today, so you know, from, from, from far away, relatively far away. Um, so I, I just wanted to, I know we're out of time now, so I want to really thank uh, Mike and John for putting together the programme. I want to thank Helen and the CPH team who have worked really, really hard to make this happen. And the fact that it's run so smoothly, apart from the gluten, um, is, <laughs> is a testament to how much work they've put in behind the scenes because things have changed and you know there have been delays and also then Kevin not being able to come and so on. So thank you for making it such a smooth event and also thanks to the, those who are behind the scenes, they are audio visual uh, um, chap up here. Sorry, I've forgotten your name. Um, uh, but it's been um, a really lovely, and it's been fantastic to be in the same room with you all. Thank you so much for coming and staying. And let's hope that some of the discussions that we've had during the day and the ideas and some of the ringing, ringing sort of let's get primary care and pu public health together a bit closer, <laughs> um, uh, that we can take those ideas forward uh, and make um, ourselves more effective. So thank you all. <laughs>